Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Rose Podcast. So this week I had my mind blown. You know that emoji where the top of the head's getting shattered off? That's one of my favorite ones. That occurred to me while I was listening to this man speak. I felt like that moment in the matrix when the walls start to turn into numbers and you start to see things in a totally different way in a more uh i don't even know if it's like fifty thousand foot view way or or just how life is filled with these patterns these constructs and you know sometimes it takes the right words in the right order and the right way of systemizing or organizing something that it makes everything fall into place it makes everything make sense i am so excited for you to experience what that emoji represents this week listening to this incredible man. Um, Before we get rolling into the episode, please, wherever you listen to this podcast, one way you could support it is by leaving it a five-star review and a written review. That is so helpful. It gets it into more people's ears and higher on the charts and all the things. I'd be so grateful if you took the time to do that. And please subscribe to it so you don't miss any episodes. We got some some real zingers coming up. And if you love this episode, please share it across your channels and tag me. Without further ado, here is Peter Crone. Peter Crone is known as the Mind Architect, and his work is incredible. He is here to help humanity reach its greatest potential. I love that, and I would like to achieve that myself personally. And he specializes in revealing the limiting beliefs and subconscious narratives that dictate and shape behavior, health, relationships, and performance. Woo! Sounds juicy, doesn't it? Let's get into it. Well, I'm excited to finally get Peter Crone on the podcast. Peter, welcome. Thank you, sir. I'm finally uh, equally, uh, I reciprocate your excitement. I'm, I'm happy to be with you, my man. I love what you do. Yeah, you know, ditto. I yeah on here we sort of explore relationship relation not you know most people think romantic relationship but really i like to explore even though romantic relationships are really such a magnifying glass to so many of our limits or our our, um, our upper limits in terms of openness and our mindset but really it's always comes back to our relationship to ourselves and yeah. you are a master of opening that door and inviting us to walk through it so uh, i'm excited to see what 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 is brought today yeah me too i'm just looking forward to the conversation and i think you know i love the fact that even though you specialize in and really make a huge difference for people in relationships i love that you sort of have that disclaimer that it's not always about romantic connotation of relationship like for me life is relativity right like we only know ourselves and everything around us by virtue of the energy of relationship relating to something. So it really is the construct by which we have our experience of anything. Yeah. So tell us in that context, you know, in this uh, my me relative to you or me relative to how I engage in whatever I'm engaging in in, in my environment, how that might inform us. Well, for most people, sadly, it informs them through the lens of pure survival. (laughs) Um, The way that they relate to themselves is sort of through these primary buckets of some sense of inadequacy, a feeling of insecurity, and invariably some sense of scarcity. Like those are the sort of the broad strokes by which most people tend to relate to themselves in life. And so from those positions that one can't help but have to compensate and develop coping mechanisms, right? which is why you just mentioned, obviously, in the construct of a romantic relationship, especially if there's a bond, you know, if it's a marriage or there's some significant relationship agreement, then it's almost like you're between a rock and a hard place. You can't run away from that, which I would assert relationships are a great catalyst to reveal, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that to me is the nature of life. I mean, one of my most popular quotes uh, that people share is that life Uh, will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. Mm -hmm. And when you really get that, it's incredibly profound um, because it's really, for me, it reveals the construct of life itself, which as far as I'm concerned, my assertion is that it's really for our spiritual evolution. It's not for our circumstantial comfort. Right? It's not like I want to amass more wealth or more following, a bigger home, the corner office, a nicer uh, car. That, that's the human game. Yeah. Uh, but for me, the game that's really afoot here, the, real, the only 
sort of game on planet Earth that is of any value, I think, is our own evolution. And we only get to evolve by virtue of relating to life and seeing where, as I said earlier, we're not free. So, so that's that to me is really what people are up against is they think that the circumstances they're dealing with, the people in their lives are the potential bane of their existence. And it's actually no, wherever you do feel that, wherever you get triggered, wherever you're upset, that's actually the opportunity to see where you are fundamentally lying to yourself and saying, I can't be with this circumstance or this person upsets me. That's a fundamental lie. I'm not saying that what they're doing, the behavior is to be condoned or it's pleasant or it's nice but it's not actually upsetting you. What's upsetting you is that you have a view of how things should be, or it's revealing some fundamental feeling of inadequacy that that person is reminding you of a very old pattern from childhood that you had already established way before that person was in your life. So, mm. you know, I, just, I, I shared a lot there, but I know you track. And so it's really, life is the opportunity through the energy of relativity to recognize where we have these primal constraints and then the opportunity beyond that is to break free from them. That's my work. <laughs> so when one is in this, I love the concept that it is someone's in sort of living the fundamental lie, right? That you were yeah. talking about in this relational experience of an unpleasant engagement or whatever it may be. Yeah. So you're saying that there's two things present there. One uh, was that it brings up an inadequacy within ourselves. And what was the other one? That it- Insecurity or scarcity. Yeah. So the behavior is reminding us of this part of ourselves. Is it that we continue to allow it on some sense that like that the belief or the inadequacy in, allows for that external relating to be tolerant or tolerated? Yeah. And, and then by witnessing it and experiencing the discomfort of, uh, you know, whatever the pain might be, that I am then invited to heal the inadequacy by changing the environment or requesting that the relationship, you know, raise its standard or raise its game. Is that fair? Yeah, that's that. That would be more in the bucket of strategy, I would say, which is where you know when people feel that they're victims of circumstance, then they have a myriad of ways of coping with that. Sometimes people just withdraw themselves from a circumstance, and at times that could be really valid. You know, if someone's in a abusive relationship. Um, for me, it's much more looking at what's my resonance? What's my frequency? Who am I? And the fact that I even attracted somebody that yeah. was whatever way they were abusive, right? It could be verbal, emotional, physical. Um, so that that's the real work because yes, you could step out of a hostile situation or an uncomfortable situation, whether it be professional, romantic or otherwise. But if you don't look at who am I in the face of that, then you're only gonna manifest something similar in another arena so it's like oh wow the woman who has sadly been you know physically abused by a, a boyfriend you know you find out that oh that's great she got out of the situation but now she's dating someone who is equally just abusive you know and it's like yeah. well hang on a minute you're the consistent theme in your relationships right so that to me is why again that quote i said is life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free until you deal with that then you don't actually attract a, a shift in circumstance, right? Yeah. So uh, that to me is the real powerful work is it's really about a shift in who we are and the way that we relate to ourselves. That's the fundamental relationship. And then uh, as a natural extension of that, it's sort of inextricably going to present us with a different life versus me staying the same, but trying to create a different life. That's that's exhausting. That's what most people do, right? They're, they want uh, to be, they want to have a sense of value in the marketplace. They want to be appreciated. They want to have a loving, passionate relationship. They want to be in great shape. But as I tell people, you don't get what you want by just wanting it. Right. <laughs> right? There has to be a shift in the actual sort of makeup of how you view yourself. If I relate to myself as I'm not good enough, and this is where it gets very slippery because the I'm not good enough really occurs at a much sort of subtler subconscious level, the way it manifests on the surface might be, gosh, you know, my boss doesn't appreciate me. Or, you know, my parents never told me that they love me. Or, you know, my wife doesn't seem to re recognize that I'm working hard to provide for her and our kids. You know, that, that may be the conscious conversation, but it's all fitting within a deeper container of that person's relationship to themselves 
is fundamentally one of I'm inadequate, which would have been triggered at a young age because perhaps they had an older sibling who was the academic scholar or they had a, an older, you know, another brother or someone who was the great athlete. And so they then translated that into I'm slightly less than. And now that became the foundation for their persona. And so then they manifested circumstances to maintain that. So until that gets transcended, because it's a fundamental lie, like no one is not good enough. That's just a story. <laughs> you know, and that's very profound for people to hear. They've got all the evidence for it. But until they realize, no, that's just something that I've adopted and I took on at a young age. And now I've created the evidence for it through my life. Then, then you're really just going to be going from pillar to post, as they say. You know, it's uh, it might look different, but it's it's the same fundamental mannequin underneath. So when I think about your quote about recognizing where you're not free, then I think about okay, well then we're imprisoned. And yeah. in my relational experience with my fiance Kylie, you know, really the first sort of 1.0 of our relationship, and then we broke up for eight nine months. 1.0 was really we were still imprisoned by our wounds. You know, yeah. we, we were still imprisoned by the codependencies and, you know, bumping up to the edges of them, couldn't figure it out, broke up, spent time apart, really dove deeper into what you're inviting, which is looking at where am I the common denominator in all the relational outcomes, all the outcomes I have in my life. And yeah. to be imprisoned, you know, by what I believe is not possible what in love and whatever, but also recognizing are my behaviors a match to what I'm hoping to call in? Like, it's pretty hard to say, you know, like you said, if you leave one relationship and you don't explore yourself within that relationship, your frequency, your patterns, your choices, then how do you expect to operate into another relationship and be different? Much like if a kid gets bullied at school and you yeah. change the school that they're at, you're, there's not a fundamental shift in the energetic of the child that attracts the energy of the bully, you Correct. know? Yeah. So yeah. Can we speak more to that? Like what are, where do you see people most imprisoned, like most not free yeah. and like, what are the signs so that they can start to recognize? It? I know you said some of them show up as these statements, like my boss doesn't value me, you know? Yeah. And, and then how does one move uh, through that, because, you know, I find one of the most challenging things for people to do is to actually do an audit of themselves to actually yeah. like sit with the shame of the reality of which I really consider that healthy shame, like healthy shame that actually says, hey, you're actually not showing up as the best possible version of yourself. So, yeah. Can we walk through that? Yeah. So, I mean, such a beautiful and articulate question. And I love that you had your 1.0 chapter with Kylie and then now uh, you've sort of revisited and you know you're literally a different you right like which is really what I'm working on I mean people talk about new year new you and it's sort of very cheesy but you know when you really understand the the, the premise of a different identity that has different thoughts feelings and consequently actions and outcomes right like there's that cascade that is very natural in terms of the process of creation so if who I am fundamentally doesn't shift, I may go and see a therapist, I might go and see a spiritual teacher, I might go and see a coach, you know, all of which are great professions and many people make a difference. But if invariably you sit in on an appointment like that or a session, oftentimes the expert is prescribing different behavior, right? Well, you should try this. Yeah. yeah. Sort of in the realm of doing, right? Yeah which can only be sustained for so long if you haven't changed who you are as the person who's doing the doing. <laughs> right? Makes sense. So that's where I love that you recognize, okay, I've got to do some self-reflection. And it is sadly pretty unique, whether it be resources because people can't you know, afford to get help or they're too busy just trying to survive and yeah. make ends meet, which you know warrants a lot of compassion that people are just trying to pay rent and put food on the table, that there isn't a time to just sit under a tree and self-reflect and meditate, but it would ironically improve their life drastically if they could look back and use sort of some sort of reverse osmosis of like where, where they are now and how that correlates to some of the experiences they had as a kid. How, how, why is it that right now I feel like I'm not valued in the workplace or at home with my partner? Huh? That's funny because when I grew up, I kind of felt the same thing, right? So mm -hmm. that's that consistent theme again. So to answer your question of like the how, it is, you know, 
The first stage I always talk about is awareness. You've got to be aware of the pattern. You've got to recognize, wow, the way that I fundamentally view myself is X. And it's usually a form of negation is what I say, meaning it's a not something like I'm not good enough, mm. you know, or I'm not special. So it's where we're sort of denying an aspect of what I would assert is our actual inherent nature, but we are by virtue of our narrative actually pushing that away. So then we obviously as a compensation are trying to garner it, right? Like, so think about infomercials, like wait, there's more, right? That is psychologically very intentional because it appeals to the fact that I don't have more, I have less because there's a mindset of scarcity, right? So it appeals psychologically and especially if it's limited, right? The first 500 callers. So it's really appealing to the human uh, programming that I'm inadequate and I don't have. And that's a lie. Like I am everything that I'm looking for fundamentally without getting too esoteric, right? Like the experience of myself is fundamentally joy, love, freedom, power, the things that I would assert people are looking for in this exogenous, whatever it is, fill in the blank, something outside of me. So it's really start with awareness, recognize, okay, what is the fundamental limitation that I have about myself? And it will always be founded on a fear. There'll be some sort of fear. Like if I'm not valued, that's my experience. I'm not getting paid enough at work or my work isn't acknowledged. Or when I come home, you know, I get sort of criticized or judged by the wife or the husband. And so I don't feel inherently valued. Then that's one thing to say, I don't feel valued. It's another thing to feel the energy of that, which is that I'm insignificant. And the fear then is more primal, which is if I'm insignificant in any group, then we tend to get kicked out of the clang. You know, we're no longer right. part of the tribe. And that's uh, now becomes a life or death proposition, which is these patterns are very primal like that. It doesn't make sense in modern society. You know, it's like you're going to stay with a buddy, like you're not going to be eaten by tigers. But the <laughs> DNA, you know, but the programming of our central nervous system still relates that way. So mm -hmm. it's for people to be able to take whatever the external perceived problem is or discomfort, translate that into what is it that I say about myself as a, as a reflection of what just transpired and what is the deeper primal fear underneath that? And then to look at the validity of that fear. Like, is it really true that, you know, I'm going to, be kicked out of the gang and I'm not gonna live. Like, no, that's, you know, it's obviously very melodramatic and it's human, so we want some compassion. But that's really all that's happening is, you know, somebody says X, you get upset uh, or someone cuts you off in traffic and you get angry. Like, and it, it's got nothing to do with reality. It's to do with where are you basically carrying a lot of accumulated mild to major trauma that still hasn't been reconciled. And that's the opportunity. It's really like, I love the word audit that you used earlier. It's really, you know, where are your emotional books not balanced? <laughs> <laughs> where are they not balanced? I like that. Like we need to be an accountant of ourselves, you know? Yeah, of our own emotional well being. And for most people, it's just an accumulation, it's a big backlog you know, of the quintessential term baggage, right? They've got a lot of baggage. I mean, it, <laughs> Like real, realtors use the term carrying costs, you know, on a house that isn't selling, right? So like humans have huge carrying costs. Isn't that fascinating to think about that of like one of the most, because when I think about not being free, well, recognizing where you're not free within yourself. Like if you don't take responsibility for your own behaviors and the way mm -hmm. you're like, like not even considering that our mind is a computer, you know, and it's our computer. Like is if I had all these, beliefs and programs placed in it as a at a young age like we all do you know unconsciously sort of observing our world how do i survive here what's yeah. the best way to be part of this family to be safe with my dad or my mom or whoever in this religion yeah. this culture it's yeah. like if i can't then as an adult because i feel like an awake when we awaken is really to just start to ask questions start to be aware of our awareness right like start yeah. to think about how we think and if we're not free to even consider that we are the ones making the choices in each moment, then yeah. you can't change your life. You know, right. like you can't possibly. And how does one sort of orient differently in that? Because I sort of found that the first time I started to be like, oh shit, like 
I got here because I chose all this stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to have a beer because that's a lot to process, you know, like I'll just wash that down with some tequila in a one night stand. <laughs> you know, I don't want to turn towards the confronting. Yeah. But liberating, like that's so liberating to know, like, yeah, all this shit that hurt. I created it in a lot of way. Not everything. Obviously, we're victims of circumstance. But what do I then do with the circumstance? Like, can yeah. I take the L the the knowledge of that and create something within myself you know as you said like we could sort of look at um from an existential perspective you know we can look at all of this has been by design and all these experiences to sort of liberate our soul in a lot yeah. of ways yeah and, yeah so what are your thoughts on on that? that that's precisely how i look at it like you know i'd say tell people i free people's minds and liberate their souls you know and that's ah. me it's what we're here Right. So if you free your mind, the mind is the shackle, like the mind is like a is the prison. And then what is the mind? It's really a space that's got this like programming, like you said, a computer. Right. So if I live within the space called I'm not good enough, it creates a container. And anybody who's within that, we could go, we can kind of go one of two ways in this world of duality and and zeros and ones and binary, which is how most people think. It's yeah. an either or proposition. So if I'm not good enough. Well, then one strategy is become a perfectionist or a people pleaser, which is the compensation for it. The other strategy is to buy right into it, which is then someone might find themselves on a slippery slope from marijuana to cocaine to what, you know, fill in the choice of escape mechanism, and then they become homeless. So the irony is that the person on the street who's, who's hitting heroin energetically, and this is a very hard thing sometimes for people to hear, is not that different from the guy in the corner office driving a Mercedes who has to be at the gym every morning to make sure he keeps the six pack, right? So that they have hugely, vastly different manifestations of the same fundamental core trauma, which is a belief of inadequacy. One just bought into it, one is constantly trying to avoid it and disprove it. Mm, fascinating. Because you're right, people wouldn't they wouldn't look at the heroin addict and be like, that reminds me of that investment banker over there. <laughs> right. you know? No offense if you're an investment banker, but there's a lot of compensation going on in that industry. Yeah. I mean, in every industry, you know, every, like I was it's a pharmaceutical rep. For sure. I was like, well, how do people see pharmaceutical reps? You know, like yeah. it was part yeah. of the uh, to hide behind the veneer, you know, yeah. that people might see that. So uh, that's interesting. Let's keep going on that one because I like okay. that. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. So when if you look at things energetically versus on the manifest level, mm -hmm. then you start to see, wow, and it breeds a lot more unity and compassion, which is why I like to make these sort of seemingly very like abrupt comparisons. But um, when we can find out what is our version of compensation, then we're going to tap into the fundamental lie, which is, you know, like I said, you're not not good enough. That's a lie. But then you've developed strategies and compensation patterns on top of it, where people can discover their compensations is usually through the experience of fatigue, exhaustion, disharmony, and disease. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And everyone can relate to those. They're like, yeah, you just you basically just rattled off everything that I struggle. With. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So when you're not quote unquote in harmony with yourself and people talk about self-love and da, 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 you know, but it's like really having that fundamental relationship with self that I fully in the most profound way, accept who I am flaws and all, then there's no longer any need to strategize, compensate or adapt. Uh, it's not to say that like, you don't want to have a nice house, a corner office and a Mercedes. Yeah. Have at it. Yeah. Like I, you know, I, I love the power of creativity and playing in this sort of incredible arena that we call planet Earth and seeing what I can create, but not from the energy of scarcity or inadequacy. That's a very different mechanism. It's for the pure joy of self-expression and creativity, whereas most people are coming from a place of reactivity, right? So it's like, I don't have, therefore I have to, through domination, manipulation, lying, whatever it takes, try and get something. But it's that's why the guy in the corner office it might look like he lives an awesome life and he's got his four bedroom place in the suburbs and blah, blah, blah. But his cholesterol's high. He struggles with anxiety. He needs to take his sleeping med and he doesn't really have a great connection with his kids, you know, so which none of which are bad. They're not judgments. But if you were to look at the overarching theme of joy in his life, 
it's not that different to the guy who's on the street, right? right. So it's yeah. a frequency. So what I'm really helping people find is, you know, without sounding again too poetic, is that real sense of inner joy, inner vitality, inner freedom, inner peace. And it's not about who you are, what you do. Uh, and that's where I think as human beings, we become so bamboozled and preoccupied with the external trappings of life as though that's where we're going to find our joy. You know, even in the independent, uh, what is it, Declaration of Independence? It's like the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> right. Like, you look at the languaging, right? It's it's not now, but keep pursuing. Yeah, keep it's pursuing like, it. We've created a whole industry. Uh, many industries live sort of on the... Yeah. on the premise of that underlying inadequacy it, it, you know course. isn't that true like i feel like marketing and as you said our biology is uh, this idea on an unconscious level of if i don't hold this belief i won't belong to this group we don't even yeah. know that that's happening that self-abandonment <laughs> is occurring just to be a, a member yeah you know, and and this invitation back to like understanding your biology is always going to be your biology. Like you might be scared of something and it not be much like you take a cold shower. Yeah. You think you're going to die. You're definitely not going to die. You know, right. and it's, <laughs> yeah. it's this observation of how our biology and our unconscious beliefs really will drive the car till mm -hmm. we decide to get behind the wheel. And yeah. that's, when I was thinking about the the corner office versus the heroin addict, it's interesting because like neither are allowing themselves to actually experience joy. Like one has a false sense or a false appearance of having a joyful life. And the other yeah. one just doesn't even allow themselves to have it. It's yeah. interesting how those coping mechanisms for the same underlying belief, one bought into it, one's trying to never experience it or never yeah. have anyone see them experience it. And yeah. so how like when i consider that that's that cultivation of joy mm -hmm. because i feel like i've definitely been more the corner office person with a dash of the streets with the street style you know like <laughs> in the alcohol you know yeah. i never got into those other things because i'm too addictive to things okay. so if i ever did cocaine i'd probably be doing it right now and not on this podcast so <laughs> it'd be an interesting conversation <laughs> yeah definitely be an interesting conversation but yeah like i found that i was both coping and both coping you know like they were yeah, different yeah. ways of coping so how does one begin the journey or deepen the journey into yeah. this pathway of joy because it it seems like scarcity is normal and you know like the other day someone called me weird and i was like thank you like that feels so good i i, I strive to be weird because normal <laughs> right. really fuck that i have no <laughs> interest i've been normal and it was you yeah. know when you meet the moment where you think your life's going to be rich with all the things you were taught to want to get to that moment and i realized like sometimes like you get to these moments and you realize you never actually wanted them because they were a want that was given to you so yeah yeah Brilliant. bring us to joy yeah Bring us to weirdom and freakiness. I, right. I yeah, normal, yeah. Look at normal. It's 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 a mess. <laughs> it's like oh, it's, it's awful. Mess. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in terms of joy, you know, I mean, this is more like where my work is akin to spiritual teaching. They call me the mind architect, obviously, but really that's just the access point, right? Like the mind is the the barricade and what we're really trying to access is what's on the other side of it. Like that's really my work. It's the premise of my book is helping people discover what's on the other side of constraint and limitation. And so that's where joy is. And that it go back to your comment earlier about the imprisoned feeling. It really is the sense of being incarcerated as a human being and doing everything you can to, you know, prettify your your cell and you know well i got nice sheets on my my bunk you know it's like yeah. and i put a piece of art in my six by six cell but really it's about um breaking out you know and breaking free and that's joy is the experience of actual liberation so what i realized is regardless of the constraint every time we evolve we expand we step outside of the previous perceived limitations that we were in, one of the byproduct experience is and emotions is, is joy. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the game is sort of this, what I call cosmic hide and seek or this quintessential sort of straitjacket of being human, you know, the Houdini effect of our own minds 
is that joy is not so much a destination, but rather it is the effortless byproduct of every time we transcend something that was previously holding us back. And when you really get that, it's such a beautiful mm. kind of mountain without a top, right? So when people say, I'm going to realize your potential, I'm like, I hope you don't, you know, because it's a never ending prophecy. You know, it's like that the, the experience of um, our own magnificence can only be found on the other side of seeing where we were in denial of it, right? So when you really get that, it's sort of... That makes sense, yeah. I, I remember I used this example once, which is my, my parents passed when I was very young, which was part of my sort of trauma and then my, my work and the catalyst for my own discoveries. My mom when I was seven and my dad when, I, when he was 17. But there was a, a, a picture of an old black and white and my mom was still alive. So I was very tiny. I was about three or four. And she's sort of gently ushering this little kid in his onesie, you know, <laughs> which was me. Uh, to somebody off frame on the left you couldn't see in the picture but because of the backdrop I knew we were at the harbor and my dad worked on the boats and um, and I could see this little kid's joy right sort of like his hands are out and I'm running towards my dad I'm sure is like crouched down and ready to pick me up with all of the love that he had for me and in looking at that picture I recognized something beautiful which is that a very huge component of love is missing and I don't mean that like it's missing. I mean, the experience of missing someone is an aspect, a very beautiful aspect of love. Because we often can, can I say like love as I'm with someone, you know, we get to go to bed together and discuss our day. We make love, we, we watch TV, but you know, there's this experience of interaction with the people we love. But for me, I love to look at the space, you know, around mm -hmm. an object, not just the object. When, when I was studying art at high school, my teacher was a freak of a guy who was fantastic, you know, like every art teacher should be. Yeah. And he was always telling us to don't draw the object, draw the space around the object and the object arises. You know, I always remember that moment. It's beautiful. Yeah. So I think the space around love, one of the aspects that people don't realize is the missing Right. And so I saw in this picture, I was like, wow, you know, if it weren't for the previous missing of my father, and of course, this isn't a conscious thought as a two year old, but, yeah. you know, then I don't get to experience the fullness of the joy of reconciliation and reconnection and the love of seeing my dad again. So why I share that story as it relates to what I was talking about is that equally the feeling of joy and I think joy, freedom, liberation, they're all synonymous, is, can only be felt because of the prior feeling of constraint. Mm. And so it's sort of like a beautiful design, like I assert, like again, it gets pretty esoteric, but we arrived as these beings who have unreconciled fears and the gods are like, hey, planet Earth is the best place for you to go because it's totally fucked up. And like you get 2020, all these great time yeah. to be there. Yeah, you'll get all of these crazy experiences that will really <laughs> trigger the hell out of you. And you'll have to recognize your own magnificence by realizing that there's absolutely nothing wrong with you and that you have no inadequacies or nothing to be scared of. And that life will sort of slough those constraints off of you if you're paying attention. And that's the joy. So a long-winded answer to your question, but really the joy is in the transcendence of the constraint. And what is the constraint? It's some linguistic construct that we have about ourselves that we're not something. And when you live in the world of I'm not something, then you feel apathetic, you feel resigned, you feel depressed, you feel anxious. So these are the, the emotional access points. If somebody listening to this right now struggles with self-doubt or anxiety or depression or addiction, then they are the catalysts born of some deeper feeling of inadequacy about yourself or your relationship to life. Like you said earlier, like, I don't feel safe. You know, well, you grew up in a, perhaps a, an environment at home that was very mercurial. Your parents, were, especially your dad, maybe would come home late. And if he'd been drinking, he'd raise his voice. And that was scary for a kid. And so you developed a relationship to life that it's, it's just not safe. And now you're a very high paid executive giving a presentation in front of a thousand people and you have immense amount of anxiety. 
nothing to do with your absence of knowledge about what you're going to speak to or the fact that the people listening care about you, but rather that you still have a relationship to life like it's not safe and somebody might suddenly get angry at me, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the joy is to be found in, oh, oh, that's my history. And the good thing about my history is it's over. It's got nothing to do with today, <laughs> right? Now that that's a flippant way of like reconciling everybody's past. You know, there's some work to be done usually, but by recognizing like what happened, and this again is one of my most popular quotes. Actually, we've got, I think nine tattoos now of this quote that people have shared, which is pretty touching. Um, I, I tell people what happened happened and couldn't have happened any other way because it didn't. And, and that's a way to sort of help for people to reconcile their history and when they let go of that which goes back to what we were saying earlier about baggage and the accumulation of things then that is the 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 reunion the reunion with the moment now which is pure possibility like this moment of life right now at 11 52 in the morning uh on whatever it is 26 the blah 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 like it's never happened before that's a new moment right like and when you really get that like not in a sort of a fortune cookie, like throwaway piece of paper way, but like energetically, like this moment is brand new. Mm. And for that reason, it is absolutely dripping in possibility, but not if I'm dragging my history with me into it. <laughs> right. Like if you're taking these old beliefs, this deep sense of inadequacy, for example, or self-doubt, into yeah. each moment, each moment will be riddled with the exact same story yeah. repeating. It's itself. like life is affording us this blank canvas consistently. Here's a new moment. Here's a new moment. Here's a new moment. But with without any judgment, because the whole process is unconscious, people are filling that canvas with the history that they've yet to reconcile or fully accept. And so it feels like they're the same person over and over. And for me, like, you know, the real opportunity of being human, especially in relationships, is to recognize you, you, you're not the same person ever. <laughs> right, ever, like ever. literally ever. You never step in the same river twice, right? As they say, because the river's not the same and nor are you. Like, even if you look at it physiologically, for the whatever 40 plus minutes we've been talking, neither of us have the same body by virtue of the fact that cells die and new cells are born. Like, if you just get that, it's it's kind of like a bit of a mind twister for most people. They're like, well, like I'm literally melting in front of you, but thank God there's new cells that are arriving to save the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Until and like, they why die, do then we die? <laughs> right. And then like, why do we not have a similar mindset with beliefs and experience and history? It's fascinating mm -hmm. how as humans, we sort of cling to the certainty of a belief that doesn't serve us, but I guess serves us in the sense that it protects us. Like the coping mechanisms I develop are yeah. really to, I guess the compensatory ones are yeah. so that I never have to experience that, but I'm living in the experience of it. Like yes. whether I choose the path of the street or the corner office, I'm still living in the experience of the inadequacy because it's motivating each moment's choice. Yes. I, a hundred percent. No, that's yeah. so, so articulate and why I was so looking forward to talking with you because I knew you'd get it, right? Like, so the energetic parameters by which a human being is being driven haven't shifted. The circumstances might look different. Yeah. But if we're on a scale of what I would assert is vertical ascension as human beings, meaning we continue to raise our frequency, then you can't stay at the same frequency and evolve. You could have different partners. Experiences, different yeah. Partners, you know, but but fundamentally, you haven't gone anywhere. And then if you want to get into reincarnation, that's when you'll come back again until you're like sufficiently challenged. Usually, unfortunately, it's a trauma, right? The guy has to have a heart attack before he revisits his diet and lifestyle, even though his doctor's been saying, hey, your cholesterol is yeah. kind of getting high. You might want to stop, you know, da, da, da. And it wasn't sufficient of a catalyst for him to make a shift. And sadly, for a lot of people, they they. They need that external trauma before they're willing to revisit who they are and the way that they feel and think and behave, you know, but why? Sorry, go on. No, it, I, I love that you get it because it really is, you know, it's sort of the definition of insanity, right? Like doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is how most people live their lives. And then they have, you know, a lot of frustration, rightly so about that. It's like I get up, go to work and it's the same thing and go to bed, have a couple of cocktails to try and wash away the day and, go and do it all again. And it's like, 
but why? Like, it doesn't have to be that way. And I have all the compassion and patience in the world because, again, people don't know. I mean, people are waking up to the fact that there are different opportunities. There are different possibilities. You can evolve. Um, and that's the most, you know, why for me, it's the most fulfilling gig I have is because it's so it's it's so humbling to help somebody discover that which they previously were oblivious to. Yeah, it's almost like the when you watch the Matrix from this perspective, you see yeah. like that red pill is the melting away of all of what you were taught about who you yeah. needed to be yeah. in whatever way that even watching the behavioral patterns mm -hmm. of your parents and the inherited wounds and trauma and beliefs, you know, like if you look up inadequacy, you gets passed down the family tree. It's like, do you want this? I didn't know what to do with it. Like, right. do you want this? <laughs> like, I didn't know it as opposed to let it go expand and that be the healing of it. You know, you talked about how essentially like the, the wounds or the, the traumas are the gateway, like that yeah. they are the gateway or the addiction, the, the whatever behaviors that are manifesting and uh, that the belief is manifesting as, or the coping yeah. mechanisms of them are the gateway. And I also thought in, in that same sense, it's like, is there an opportunity for us when we enter this? Why do we usually have to wait? You know, like, what is it about humans that, and I did this, you know, where you wait till it's so bad, you have to, rather yeah. than I'm being, I'm attuned to the energetic that there's friction here. And so I actually need to change. Like I'm being informed by my yeah. body and by the, yeah. that the environment or the choices I'm making are not in alignment to my soul's greatest evolution. But I, granted, I didn't think like, oh, my soul's here to evolve. And these are the challenges, you know, not yeah. till. I got smashed in the face by a cosmic two by four. And I went, right. oh, like maybe I'm here to be more, do more than what I was taught because doing what I'm taught, life feels pretty empty, even though I'm yeah. supposed to be fulfilled, which is a fucked yeah. up moment to get to. So yeah, yeah, like why do we wait till we have to? And how do we maybe stop doing that? Because that's <laughs> fucking painful. Right. And and how do we enter these gateways, like these gateways that you're talking about? Yeah, great question. I love, and I love how much you're committed to finding, you know, some sort of guidelines for people, you know, like whether it be because for your audience, you want people to be able to actually have some sort of map to follow, right? So, yeah. But the why is because the primordial imperative of every organism, first of all, is to survive, right? We just want to survive. And invariably, that's at all costs, right? The, kill or be killed mechanism is still very strong in human beings in our DNA. So that's the first thing is we always want to survive. Now, when it comes to the human psychology part of that, the funny part is what we always want to survive is our own image. And so Same when you really, that. so, so basically, and you could probably, you've probably spoken to this in ways that, you know, you didn't even realize, but the number one imperative of the ego is to be right. Oh yeah, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely understand that one. So, so now you start to put it together and go, okay, well, the primordial imperative is to survive, and that part of me that I identify with as though that's who I am, I call it the ego, the identity, because it's on the foundation of trying to survive. It has to be right about the beliefs that it's identified with, because yeah. If, if it's not, then that's the annihilation of self, then which ironically- the identity gets shattered. Which is liberation, which right, is what which I'm is, saying, like, which is, liberation. Which is okay. what we're actually aiming for, but people resist it because they're like, what do you mean <sighs> I'm not, what do you mean I'm not Christian? Like they will kill you, you know, maybe not the Christians, but some religions, right? But no, no one on the planet is Christian, like no one. You may subscribe to the tenets of Christianity. You were given the moniker because your parents were apparently Christian, but they weren't either. It's a label, a construct, none of which is bad. I'm just pointing out the physics of something and realizing that you live within the constructs of whatever that doctrine, you've been indoctrinated to believe within whatever's the right and wrongs of that particular story. So mm. once you start to see, I'm lit, like, I'm not Peter Crone. Like it's, it's handy, you know, but my own, <laughs> like it's helpful. It's if, I'm walking down the, it's yeah, if I'm walking down the street, someone says, Hey, Peter, it's like, I look around, you know, but, <laughs> but the essence of who I am is not dictated by the, the sounds that are given to me. Right. So once you start to see, wow, 
the true liberation is actually the dissolution of the idea of myself, which is why my catchphrase to people is I don't solve problems, I dissolve them. And that's a dis that's such mm. a powerful distinction. It really right? is. Because it's it doesn't need to be solved. It just needs the, to be dissolved. There's so, nothing, there's nothing wrong. The only thing that's wrong is the idea that you think there's something wrong. Like as I tell people, yeah. the only problem you have is believing that you have a problem. And then when you believe that you have a problem and you try to solve it. Well, now you're just in this vicious game of reinforcing the very constraint that you're allegedly trying to overcome with, with all the like best intentions. But this is why it's madness and people end up on prescription drugs or, you know, street drugs and all the BS that's going on in the world right now that people have, so many people have subscribed to is because these same mechanisms are at play. It's mm. just appealing to fear. But in the dis dissolution of the idea of myself, which is fundamentally trying to be right, to go back to your question, why do we do this? I need to survive. Okay, who's the I that's trying to survive? Well, the I is my nationality, my religion, you know, da 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 da, my looks, my my value in the marketplace. I'm a lawyer. I'm a doctor. You know, it's like no, you're not. Like these are things you do, but it's not who you are, right? Mm -hmm. So once we start to un unravel the monikers and the labels and the titles and the, the things that we've accumulated over time, what are we left with? That's that to me is the inquiry, the inquiry that I, I help people to discover is like, then you're left with pure possibility. You are the blank canvas. And then that gives people this feeling of liberation and joy versus no, I am something. And invariably the something I associate myself with is limited and being limited when who I am at my core is unlimited. My essence is boundless but my view of myself is very bound. Those two don't go, the delta between those two is suffering. Mm. If, if in my nature, mm. I am pure freedom, but the way that I relate to myself is I'm limited, that's a discomfort. Yeah. And from the perspective of limitation, we tend to look externally for some source of, you know, happiness, joy, value, escape, whatever it is, versus I'm helping people go, no, if you remove the perception of limitation, freedom naturally arises because like it always doesn't even exist <laughs> so essentially our consumption or materialized like what we do to soothe the, the friction that exists in the limit is really to treat the pain of that friction like the I, pain of the unrecognized potential that we've put in place for ourselves that just um, must yeah. be dissolved unconsciously for which there's no fault and there's no guilt or shame guilt and shame belong to the ego but the ego mm. based on its constructs because it's discomforting it's only natural that we are pulled toward things that give pleasure and we avoid things that are, create yeah. pain right this is just biological so when we're in a state of pain which you have to be i don't pain to me is much more physiological or biological I prefer to use suffering when it relates to mind and emotion. So most people are in a state of suffering. They just are, you know, yeah. they think it's, well, if my, my wife or my husband would change, or if I had more money, then my suffering would go. No, it wouldn't go anywhere because they're just circumstances. <laughs> the things that you're experiencing as it relates to your suffering is because of the constraint you're living in psychologically. Now, these are deep patterns based on the things that you went through as a kid. Therefore, there's no fault until you learn oh, wow, I didn't realize that for 30 years, I really thought that I wasn't valued because I was never told that. And now you see all the ramifications of that in life. Then you start to have some responsibility for it, right? But ultimately, you know, the, the, why I'm able to do what I do is because I said I dissolve problems. I, I tell people I can't give you something you don't already have. But what I can do is remove what's in the way of you seeing that. And that's priceless. That is the gateway. Like, okay, so when someone recognizes what you're saying, like I have these beliefs, I mean, it's hard to do that, right? Because then we, mm -hmm. they have the possibility of changing. And I notice, especially sort of currently, but this has always been true, I think of a lot of religious experience, and I grew up Catholic, but I saw this in the Christian religion, the Mormon mm -hmm. religion, which I was more exposed to as a child, is that if if the belief or there's flexibility, like I might be taught this about religion and then, but wait, that person made that choice and I still love them and they're still human. Why are we exiling them? Right? Like that yeah. creates, there's something that doesn't make sense in the construct of what the belief I'm supposed to hold, but what my soul is actually experiencing. Yeah. So when we hear something like you're saying, which is my identity and my beliefs are actually all 
just constructs, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> and by holding a belief or an identity, like I'm a doctor or I'm a pharmaceutical rep or I'm a addict or yeah. I'm whatever, I then anything that challenges that identity and belief causes dissonance that I'm going to have to let it go, which then means I'm free floating. Right. Yeah. Which means I've got nothing to grasp to. There's no certainty. There's just unrealized yeah. potential. So is the experience because I really like taking an experience that we would normally try to avoid or categorize what I would call dissonance, the experience of dissonance, of knowing what you're speaking to and being like, well, fuck, if I let go of all that shit, I have a bunch of potential I haven't done. I got a bunch of situations I've created. I want to be right. Why do I, you know, all this shit, it causes a cascade. Yeah. What is the uh, way we can orient to what has been classified as dissonance? Is it really just the invitation to joy? You know, as I'm like thinking about this is like yeah. the, what is the suffering is really just the invitation. It's like the gateway. It's like, why don't you just walk through this fucking door? Like, why are yeah. you sitting there? You know, I think it's Rumi who says like, why do you stay in the prison when the door's right there? And it really yeah. feels like what you're saying is, it's almost too simple, Peter. Like I feel a bit like, <laughs> yeah. oh wait, so I'll just stop doing these things. It all fucking melts away like the matrix. And now I'm standing in unlimited yeah. potential with yeah. the six pack, who knows? But yeah, <laughs> it's there. Um, no, I mean, listen, you've got a great mind and I love how quickly you're grasping this and it can be incredibly challenging. So this dissonance that you speak of. So if somebody has a view of themselves and it gets challenged, uh, as you said, and then you walk into this abyss where all of a sudden you don't know who the hell you are because you've previously been identifying with some limited identity. That's one version, but that's not normally what happens, right? What normally happens is when my identity is challenged, I fight. <laughs> that's what most people do. I have but... not seen any of that today. This is just... <laughs> <laughs> not around the world, no. So because people, going back to what I said, want to be right, what do they want to be right about? This is the thing that's fascinated my work of over two decades of doing this, is that people would rather be right about their inadequacies, their insecurities than be free. I mean, when you really get that, mm. it's mind boggling. They, you know, the expression, fight for your limitations and they're yours. That's what people are doing. <laughs> yeah. That's what they're doing. And this is why, but it is shifting. And I think this is why even for someone like myself, like my work has become increasingly popular. Like, you know, it's just been exponential the last couple of years because I think people are ready to let go of those constraints. People are tired of suffering and they're tired of the mechanisms that have been presented to them, usually through marketing, as the means to escape suffering. You know, whether it be like the talk to your doctor or it's the... 5% alcohol, or it's like healthy people who are drinking a different alcohol, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's puppies running in the meadows, you know, and the side effects are like nausea, dry mouth, like <laughs> death. <laughs> like, so people are like tired of just like not feeling great, or when people say mm. I'm tired of being tired, you know, so um, that that's where I feel like the rubber's hitting the road for a lot of people now, it's like they see the opportunity to step out of the shackles of their very own mind. I mean, people are prisoners of their own mind through no fault of their own, which is why we want to start right. with compassion. But once you see it, it really is one of those epiphany type moments of like, wow. I, I mean, when I, I, I get to do this pretty much every day, right? Like the people I speak to who are like, oh my God, I have done this for 40 years. Like, and it can be disconcerting to your point. I mean, even the matrix, they, the line from Morpheus is like, we don't free a mind beyond a certain age, you know, because mm -hmm. the, the, the patterning, it becomes so entrenched. And if you look at it physiologically, you look at a child, super gullible, super impressionable, like the mind is in a state, which is pretty much like a tape recorder. Like we just take everything as fact, right? You know, yeah. Uh, you're worthless you're a mistake like that's imprinted now and that person's you know gonna do awful things to themselves in the future because of what they heard as though it's a fact but children are for that reason physiologically in pretzels on the floor and their knees are in like in you know and, and a person in their mid-40s is like oh my god it's like making my my <laughs> head right? just looking at that you know it's like <laughs> So there's this sort of beautiful correlation between mind and body and the ability to be adaptable and flexible as a child. And likewise, the older we get, 
you know, the more quote unquote sort of stiff we become, both in our perception, we become stubborn, but equally in our physiology. And so for me, like, you know, there's so many beautiful benefits of like breaking free of the constraints of your mind, which speak massively to not only your joy, but your like vitality, your aliveness, you know, like your earning capacity in the marketplace. Like I'm, I'm playing tennis against kids half my age who are just out of college, you know, and I'm, I'd argue just as fit, usually quicker. I might not be as talented, but, you know, and I would assert a lot of that is just because of my mindset, you know, that I'm not stuck in my ways of like, ah, you know, if you'd seen me when I was at your age, you know, totally, totally that kind of old lecturing of like, no, that that's not me. I am boundless. I am eternal. I am limitless in my view of myself. And then my physiology is just what it is, you know, which tends to replicate energetically from the way that I perceive myself. If I perceive myself as, you know, some old grouch who's in his fifties and da, 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 it's like, well, then my body will go, oh, okay. If, if that's what you want to manifest, I can come <laughs> like, up we know you. that archetype. We got you. We got you. Yeah. We got some ailments for that. Like, yeah, yeah. you have good insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's slap 25 pounds of abdominal adiposity on you and give you a bit of a backache. We got you. Yeah. Yeah. You'll fit right in. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything you're speaking to is such a beautiful, um, like, I feel the resonance in your words, the truth of them, the invitation to not leave anything on the table. Like you said, like, when someone says, I, I hope I can't wait to achieve my pure potential. And it's like, I hope you never do. You yeah. know, and you're really speaking to we're always falling off the ledge of what was known, like each moment, yeah. like you and I have never had this conversation, our words have never come together, like they are in this moment. And the next time we speak, it will be a different experience. It's like, yeah, this is everything. And I think currently too, in the world, this, your work has always been relevant. It's and, and it's also incredibly relevant now because we're all being invited to shatter the paradigms of what we believe is true. What is our political identity? What is, because if no. I can't take in information that destabilizes my current belief system, then my goal isn't to find the truth. It's to feel certain and to feel safe, perceive yeah. safety though, because it's not actual safety because it's not based no. on truth. Right which yeah. I continue to do this work of how do I continue to dance in the space and the bridge between what is one perspective and another? How do I not take one on? Cause the ego in me for sure wants to take on one yeah. and then be oppositional rather than be in the space between that we can hold both. But that's really standing in the space of potentiality. That's yeah. being able to look at my own life and my own experiences and how I show up. Am I open to feedback? Am I not? But really yeah. one, this, what you're also saying has me or has us orient differently relationally, because if, if I'm orienting with the perspective that everything is just feedback to my potential or where I'm experiencing friction and suffering so that I can remove that construct, yeah. then my partner telling me, Hey, like, I felt like you could have been more considerate or spoken differently. <laughs> normally we're like uh okay well you want to talk about speaking differently <laughs> what about that time you know instead of actually and that might be true but instead of receiving that and actually my potential does it dissolving and my potential being realized by accepting that truth yeah. um i mean your art i think it's no sort of it's not an exaggeration in any way to say that what you're presenting to us here will completely radically change our life and our experience completely. Like not even a question in my mind. Yeah, thank you for recognizing that. I mean, one of the sort of subtexts of my work and my intention in my business is to give birth to a new type of human being. Mm. Well, I, yeah. I feel it. Yeah, and it's no small undertaking, right? And it, at some level, it might seem a little bit you know, I don't like the word conceited, but it's like, I really believe that that's what this work is. And I've seen it through thousands of people that I've either worked with directly or hundreds of thousands of people who have experienced my work, which is, it's really the death of an idea of ourselves that no longer serves us. And this is what we're seeing around us right now, the crumbling of structures of constructs that are based in fear and limitation. You look at the pretense, for example, of the healthcare system. It is so ingrained into society that people still use the word healthcare. 
It is the biggest misnomer. A doctor studies anatomy, structure, physiology, function, pathology, you know, what's wrong, and then pharmacology for treatment and then occasionally intervention for surgery, right? That's what they study. They didn't study anything about health. Mm -hmm. It's a sick care system. But whether it was by sinister design or just by dumb, you know, misfortune, calling it healthcare is giving people the pretense, as you said, of safety or health. It's not. It's phenomenal for intervention and emergencies and triage. And like, if I'm in a car accident, like I had the most ridiculous experience a few weeks ago where I had a macadamia nut stuck in my esophagus. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank God, not in my trachea, right? Like that's where I can breathe. But here I can even swallow my own saliva. It was literally filling the tube that goes from the mouth to the stomach. Yeah, it was discomforting to say the least, but I wasn't dying, but I had to go to the ER. First time in my life, you know, 50 something year old, never been to the ER, thank God. But in this situation, phenomenal that there's a sick care system that knows how to deal with problems. But that to me speaks to where we have these constructs that are a disservice to the potentiality of what it means to be a human. The systems that are in place sustain constraint mm -hmm. right we look at a doctor in a lab coat and think oh he's going to fix me well first of all now you're reinforcing the fact there's something wrong with you why don't we look at that so that you don't go and see a doctor in ayurveda which is part of my work which is from india like chinese medicine the most revered vaidya vaidya is like practitioner is the one that doesn't have any patients <laughs> because he's educated his community on how to stay healthy isn't that beautiful it's so, so anyway so, so there's so many things that are falling apart, but the way, the, 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 the way to expedite that, as you so articulately and very generously reflected back to me, is that you can not be the same person if you're willing to take on what I'm talking about. Right. You literally have to metamorphosize just as a caterpillar to become the butterfly. What I'm inviting people to consider is that you can step out of a world of limitation, fear and suffering and be a human being who's founded in love, freedom, and possibility. Mm. Mm. And even the grief of recognizing, because when I think of taking on like everything melting away and then me taking on this potentiality, like stepping into it or yeah. maybe receiving it is a better term, but it's like- as Allowing I, it because it's there. Yeah. yeah, like it's not something I have to stand in, it's already exists. Yes. So if I do that, there might be a simultaneous healthy expression of grief of having not done that because you feel everything that's possible. Like, holy shit, why the fuck have I done all this stuff? Why have I stayed in these relationships? Why have I accepted yeah. less for myself? Why have I, I knew yeah. I didn't like that job. I knew I didn't like that person. Red yeah. flags every fucking where. I can't believe I didn't see all this. And in, in like stepping into that, it's almost like that grief though is yeah. actually joy. Like the grief is actually like, joy that you're there that it's happening that like like sadness that is because you know tears of sadness are actually chemically different than tears of th than tears of joy yeah. but i think in this sense they would be the same you know or maybe there's an alchemical process that the sadness is cleaning out the space or or something's dying and that i was is gonna say it's that the word that comes to mind is death hmm. And I love how articulately you capture what I'm sharing, you know, because we've never got to have this conversation before. It's funny how many people I work with simultaneously experience, it's giving me chills now, as I say it, the most profound freedom they've ever had with, as you said, this feeling of regret. Mm. Mm. Simultaneous. It's like such a unique experience, right? It's like, pure possibility has just literally landed on their doorstep. Like they never even knew it was possible. A feeling of liberation has cascaded through their body that they had never even considered possible. And at the same time, they're like, oh my God, and I'm 45. Like, what have I done with my life? Right, right. But at that moment, I hold the space of compassion and let them say to themselves, it couldn't have been any different because it wasn't like my quote earlier that what happened happened and couldn't have happened in any other way because it didn't. And that's where we bring in compassion and simultaneously then you suddenly hit gratitude. That for whatever way my life has been orchestrated, I'm one of the lucky ones who even if I am 45 or I'm working with a 74 year old right now, of course I work with 15 to, you know, maybe not 15 so much, but like young 20 year olds, 
yeah, if they get this experience at that age, wow. Oh, oh my God. But for any human being, because it goes back to what I said, the, the real game of humanity, as far as I'm concerned, is reconciliation of your own constraints, to break free from the prisons of your own mind. And so many people never even come close to that adventure, to that journey or that opportunity. So it really is a rare opportunity that you discover, wow, I have been the generator of my own suffering, unbeknownst to myself, for which there is no guilt, no shame, but now I can stop. And I can finally, for the first time in my life, discover what it means to truly be at peace. Well, there it is. Peter, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and uh, feel the edges of my own psyche uh, left on the floor here where I'm sitting. <laughs> um, where can people find more from you? And do you have anything coming up that people can look forward to in terms of being able to work with you? And, and what might that look like? Well, firstly, thank you. And I'm glad that you're willing to take on the, uh, the, the role of dying in front of me and everyone else. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, Happily it's, dead, right here. <laughs> yeah. Death never felt so good. Yeah. Uh, and it really is that sort of that beautiful cycle of life, right? Like to, to, to really be alive to me it can only happen if you're willing to continually shed these versions of yourself and die. So, um, but to answer your question, thank you. Um, PeterCrone.com is my website. And then social media, uh, Peter Crone Official. Um, although I think we're actually about to get Peter Crone, which uh, Way is to go. A, yeah, yeah, look at that. So anyway, they'll find me. Um, and then upcoming, I do have actually, for the first time ever, I'm doing something called a mastermind focused on coaching. It's not a certification program, but it's going to look at my methodology. So this group of extraordinary people committed to discovering the, that sense of freedom and peace that we just ended on um, will start in the end of February. So hopefully this will be out. People might be able to catch it. It's a six month journey. We meet once a month online, so you can be anywhere. And it's the first time people will get to engage with me. I've done a lot of workshops, but it's usually streamed and you just watch it at your own leisure. It's not a conversation. So I personally am so excited because one, I'm tired of just talking to my laptop by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and two, you know, it's so fun to get real life uh, reactions. And then when I help coach mm. people, we'll unpack it so everyone in the group can understand the methodology. So that's, that's the most exciting thing that I've got coming up is uh, my mastermind. And I'd love, love for people to jump in because it's going to you know, it may seem uh, quite um, audacious of me to say, I think it's going to be one of the most powerful experiences anyone could ever go on. Yeah, I can sense that. Well, thank you for your time, for your mind, for your heart, for your soul, and for the work that you do. And uh, everyone listening, go check out Peter, check out his mastermind that's coming up. Stay tuned to the stuff he's got going down the pipeline. And Peter, thank you, sir. Thank you, brother. Much love.